stacked up. Matthew, the first chapter, starting with verse 18. Matthew. Chapter number one. Starting with verse number 18. And I will be reading in your hearing from the New International Version. Here's what it says. Facebook people still coming into the church. May God be praised. This is how the birth of Jesus the Messiah came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph. But before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law and yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. Concluding with verse 21, she will give birth to a son and you are to give him the name Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. Amen. Verse 21 again. She will give birth to a son and you are to give him the name Jesus. Because he will save his people from their sins. Amen. Amen. You may be seated in the sanctuary, the grass withers, and the flower fades. But the word of God shall stand forever. With your prayers and your attention, and with the help of the Lord, I want to talk about the birth of Jesus. Yeah. That's what I want to talk about today. The birth of Jesus. People still coming in, Facebook. <laughs> Ain't God all right? The birth of Jesus. All that we celebrate about our salvation starts with the birth of Jesus. All that we celebrate about our sins being forgiven and about being reconciled back to God start with the birth of Jesus. Uh -huh. All that we celebrate about eternal life in heaven after life on earth starts with the birth of Jesus. Yeah. We make a lot of noise about the death of Jesus. And we get excited when we talk about the crucifixion of Christ because we tend to think that all of his sacrifice for us was on a hill called Calvary. Because we think that all of his sacrifice for us was at a place called Golgotha. Because we think that all of his sacrifice for us was on the cross in death, not realizing that his sacrifice for us did not start with his death on the cross, 
but rather his sacrifice for us started with his birth in a manger. Yeah, yeah. There was a glory that he shared in heaven with God his Father before he came to earth to be born. There was a glory that he shared in heaven with God his Father before he came to earth to be human. Yeah. There was a glory that he shared in heaven with God his Father before he came to earth to be anthropomorphically in flesh. And it was that same glory that he lost. It was that same glory that he gave up. It was that same glory to which he was eager to return according to the sneak peek of his prayer that we are afforded in John 17 verse 5 when Jesus prayed just before he would be arrested and now Father glorify me in your presence yeah. with the glory I had with you before the world began. Yeah. And so you see church all of his sacrifice for us did not start when he died. But it started when he was born. Is anybody in church today? It was a sacrifice just for him to be conceived. It was a sacrifice just for him to be in the womb. It was a sacrifice for him just to be an embryo. It was a sacrifice just for him to be a fetus. It was a sacrifice just for him to be born. Yeah. Why? Because he left strength uh -huh. to put on a suit of weakness. Yes, sir. He left power to put on a suit of frailty. Uh -huh. He left light to put on a suit of darkness. Why was it a sacrifice? Because he left the imperishable for the perishable. He left the incorruptible for the corruptible. And he left immortality for mortality. Yeah. Why was it a sacrifice? Because he left heaven for the earth. Yeah. He left the holy for the hellish. And he left a place to stay for no place at all. Which is why we hear him in Matthew 8 and 20 saying, Foxes have holes, and the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. Are y'all with me? And so you need to know and understand, church, that the sacrifice of Jesus did not begin on the cross when he died, but it began in the manger when he was born. For the world that he made because of its sin and because of its incessant love affair with darkness made sure that it would be an uncomfortable place for Jesus. I said that the world he made made sure that it would be an uncomfortable place for Jesus. Yeah. And God knew that this world would be an uncomfortable place for Jesus. <laughs> and watch this. God also knew that the church at times would itself be an uncomfortable place for Jesus too. Come on, Pastor. Yet, he would still have this angel to tell Joseph, that she will give birth to a son. And you are to give him the name Jesus. Because he will save his people from their sins. Amen. The sacrifice of Jesus did not begin when he died. But it began when he was born. The birth of Jesus was such a monumental moment in salvation's history that Satan's ire was immediately aroused against him and he would oppose Jesus as soon as he was born. Uh -huh. 
Uh -huh. Oh yes, the birth of Jesus got so much attention in the spiritual realm amongst the angels that they rejoiced and praised God, exclaiming glory to God in the highest and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. That's how the angels responded to the birth of Jesus, but on the flip side, Satan put a hit out on Jesus time he was born. Yeah. The birth of Jesus was so significant in shifting the way that we would approach God, no longer needing a priest for us to reach him, and no longer needing a prophet for him to reach us, but only needing Jesus the priest and Jesus the prophet to work for us in both ways. So significant was the birth of Jesus in creating this spiritual shift that not only was there no room for him in the end, but he had to hotel it out of town to Egypt because Satan, through King Herod, was trying to kill him. I'm trying to tell somebody that the sacrifice of Jesus did not start when he died. But it started when he was born. Yeah. King Herod, you know the story. So afraid of this baby King Jesus, he'd heard about. Had all the male boys in Bethlehem, two years old and younger, slaughtered. Yeah. In an effort to kill the king who had just been born. And you know, it may be the only time in history when the Savior himself was saved by the death of others before his death would save so many. I'm just trying to tell you that the sacrifice of Jesus did not start when he died, but it started when he was born. What we see as we consider the birth of Jesus is that his sacrifice began from day one with two problems in particular. Number one, finding a place to live. And number two, finding a place to stay alive. Again, number one, finding a place to live. And number two, finding a place to stay alive. These are the problems that Jesus had from day one. Yes. Between being forced into a manger and being forced out of town, consequently resulting in him struggling to find a place to live and finding a place to stay alive. Uh -huh. uh, I bring this up, church, because I believe these problems yet exist for Jesus today. He's always looking for a heart in which to live. Yeah. And he's always looking for a heart that will keep him alive. Because you see, it's one thing to let him into your heart, but it's another thing to keep him alive once he's there. Yeah. It's one thing to welcome him into your heart on one day, but it's another thing to keep him alive in your heart every other day. So many who once a part of town let him in to live in their hearts have done such a poor and miserable job of keeping him alive in the same place. That's why so many empty pews in here right now. And you ought to keep in mind, you ought to keep in mind that Hebrews 6 and 6 suggest that it might be possible for those who let Jesus in to fall away from the faith and by doing so will only crucify Jesus all over again. Question, how often do you crucify Jesus? How often do you kill him through your sin? How often through disobedience do you tell him that his first death was not enough for you? On, Presuming that you ever really let him in in the first place, if you have him, how well do you keep him 
him alive through your daily obedience and spiritual discipline. Come on now. Or do you keep hanging him up on that old rugged cross? Uh -huh. Even though God knew that Jesus would be crucified and re-crucified, he still sent this angel yeah. to tell Joseph that she will give birth to a son. And you are to give him the name Jesus. Yeah. Because he will save his people from their sins. Uh -huh. Ah, this 21st verse, when you look at it, has three segments or three clauses to it, separated by two commas. In the first clause, we see what God is doing. Come on. In the second clause, we see what we are doing or what we should be doing. And in the third clause, we see the blessings that can spring forth when the first two align and come together. Say with me now, the first clause, which was the motivating force of this message today, says she will give birth to a son. Amen, amen. She will give birth to a son. That, when you know the story, is clearly what God is doing. Because you see, it has nothing to do with Mary, Joseph, or anybody else. They didn't ask for it. They didn't look for it. Nor did they earn it or expect it. It was simply God's will. And you know that it was his will and his doing. Why? Because Mary was a virgin. And I feel like that's a word so old and ancient that we hardly even hear that word anymore. Huh? Our world has become so sex crazed and sex driven and so vocally and visibly sexual that it just forces adult material in front of young children every day, all day. Things that should be reserved for adults are in front of our youth 24 7 on TV, radio, billboards, the internet, and every other media outlet. When I was growing up, my brother and I, we had to at least wait until nighttime to try to catch a little something, something on cable. <laughs> but it's all day long nowadays. Yes, it is. So someone I feel may not even know what a virgin is. Uh -huh. Because young people are so enticed and so tempted to move forward that they no longer wait. And so since I'm here, let me just say this as I move along to whoever might be listening, young folks especially, some things are still worth waiting for. Amen. I thought I would have got a little bit more amen right there, but I guess that's part of the problem. But let me move on. A virgin is someone who has not engaged in intercourse. Yes, and Mary was a virgin. And in spite of all that science is doing today with artificial insemination and even trying to figure out ways for men to give birth, last I checked, there still ain't but one way huh, for natural birth to occur. And it's when a man yes, sir. and a woman yes, which by the way is being debated today what is a man and what is a woman. People are trying to define and redefine trying to assign and reassign gender. Uh -huh. uh, at any rate in order for natural birth to occur last I checked a man and a woman must be together yes. and she is the one who will give birth and not the man. Amen. It's the 
still true today and it was true back then. So if Mary was a virgin, yeah. yet the angel told Joseph that she will give birth to a son, then that is clearly nobody but God. And it is what God was doing. Is anybody listening to me? And you need to know today that God, church, is always doing things in your life for you that you did not ask for and you do not expect. He's always at work in your life, exercising his divine will. And if you know what's good for you, you need to do everything you can to let him do it. God had a role to play in the first clause. But Joseph, Joseph, who represents you and represents me, Joseph had a role to play in the second clause. God had a role to play in the first segment of this verse. But Joseph had a role to play in the second segment of this verse. And whenever we bump heads with God, whenever we clash with God, it's typically because while he's fulfilling his role in the first clause, we are not fulfilling our role in the second clause. First, she will give birth to a son. Second, and you are to give him the name Jesus. Yeah, 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 yeah. You see, church, there's always something that we are to do according to what God has told us. Yeah, yeah, yeah. God is always giving us instructions. God is always giving us direction. And God is always giving us commands to follow according to his word. He's always ordering our steps in his word, but we don't always follow his word. He's always telling us what to do, but we don't always listen to what he says. God is always providing instructions for us. Instructions that he expects us to follow. Why? Because we have a role to play in demonstrating our faith. Just as much as God has a role to play in demonstrating his faithfulness. I believe I'll say that again because we have a role to play in demonstrating our faith. Just as much as God has a role to play in demonstrating his faithfulness. Your faith walk is not about just sitting back to watch God do all the work, even though he could, but he leaves room for you. He leaves room for me. He leaves room for us to have a role to play in cementing and developing our own faith. That's why you have to work out your own salvation. In fact, newsflash. The only way for you to increase your faith is through obedience. Simple as that sounds, a lot of people might not catch that. The only way for you to strengthen your faith and to build your faith and to fortify your faith is by doing what the Lord has told you to do. That's why so many of you have such a weak faith in the first place. Because you won't practice your faith. You won't exercise your faith by obediently doing what he tells you to do. But Joseph was not that way. And I'm glad about it, church. Because if God had given some of y'all these same instructions to name him Jesus, Y'all have been all off task trying to call Jesus little man man or little boosy or something that ends either with a clevius or a clavius. Huh? Some of y'all stumbled over 
the simplest of instruction from the Lord. But Joseph played his position. Yeah. Joseph played his part. Yeah. And he would name the boy Jesus. Yeah. And like I told you already, when what you are doing in the second clause lines up with what God is doing in the first clause, great things are bound to happen by the third clause. Uh -huh. For he was to give him the name Jesus, which is Joshua in Hebrew, and it means the Lord saved. Yeah. Because he would save his people from their sins. And his people are not just the Jews, uh -huh. but they are the Gentiles too. Yeah. Not just one people, but all people who will receive his salvation by faith. For the Bible says there be neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. For we are all the seed of Abraham, if you believe. Yeah. Well, I'm done, church. I just wanted to deepen your appreciation for the birth of Jesus today. And I hope I've done so. And I don't want you to miss the blessings and miracles that burst forth from the third clause. Yeah. I'm so grateful that in spite of all that Jesus would suffer, God still sent that angel to tell Joseph that she will give birth to a son. Yeah. And you are to give him the name Jesus. Because he will save yeah. his people from their sins. Yeah. Yes, uh -huh. in spite of all uh -huh. that Jesus would have to endure. God still sent the angel to tell Joseph that she will give birth to a son and you are to give him the name Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. Yes, in spite of all that Jesus would have to go through, God still sent that angel to tell Joseph that she will, she will, she will give birth to a son. And you are to give him the name Jesus because he will, oh, he will, he will save his people from their sin. Am I right about it? Even though Joseph had no clue about what was going on. Yes, God still sent an to tell Joseph that she oh, shut it. She Believe and 
call on his holy name, they still will have sin. They have sin, but they will be saved. They have iniquities, but they will be saved. They have transgressions, but they will be saved. Yes, they have wrongdoing, but they will be saved. They have shortcomings. Am I by myself in here? But they have shortcomings, but they will be saved. They make mistakes from the pulpit to the door, but they will be saved. They have plenty of flaws. They have plenty of flaws. They have plenty of flaws. They have plenty of flaws, but they will be saved. Saved from what somebody said. Saved from eternal damnation. Saved from the lake of fire. Saved from never ending torment. Saved. Saved from death. Saved. Saved from the grave. From the wrath of God, Sign from the penalty of sin, Sign from the pit of hell, because He will save His people from their sins. Yes, she will give birth to and you are to give him the name Jesus because he will save. I said he will save. 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 Thank <laughs> you. 
and so many wonderful things. If we can get what we do to line up with what God is doing, yes, sir. Yes, sir. there can be so much new life Amen. by the third clause, the birth of Jesus. Yes, God bless you. The doors of the church are open. There might be someone here or online who has not accepted or received the gift of eternal life from Jesus Christ, our Lord. He's always looking for a place to stay. Uh-huh. But he's no longer in that suit of flesh. But he is a spirit. And he wants to know, can he live with you in your heart? That's where he wants to live. That's where he wants to reside. That's where he wants to abide and dwell is in the heart of men and women, boys and girls. But Jesus never keeps the door in. He never beats the door to your heart down. He waits for you to voluntarily open it for him to come in. And once you open your heart and let him in, then he wants to know how well will you keep him alive. Don't have him come in and then tell him, now you go sit down over there until I call you. That's how a lot of us live, man. Jesus, now you go sit over there and don't say nothing, don't move until I call on you and have need of thee. But that's not how this is to work. You let him in and you keep him alive by allowing him to lead you and guide you every step of the way. And I would think that if he is the one, in fact, who was sent to save his people, to save us from our sins, shouldn't he receive our compliance? Shouldn't he receive our obedience? Shouldn't he receive our faithfulness to his word and his commands? Many of us have found our parents to be worthy of our obedience. How much more worthy is the Lord? God bless your Facebook, but it is our prayer that you will open up your heart to receive Jesus, to accept him, and to let him in. Because it's really just as simple as that. It's not so te technical and mechanical. You don't have so much that you have to go through to be saved. You just have to receive Jesus sincerely, authentically in your heart, and he will save you. But that's the only way your journey begins. Which is why I harp so much on the need and the importance for Christian education. Because too many in the church operate as if Jesus Christ is all that you need. And sure, he is, but he wants us to know more about him and his word. And we have to practice our faith as we work out our soul salvation. God bless your Facebook and Merry Christmas.